Hello, this is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool. Today's video is going to take a fundamental look at Johnson & Johnson with the primary objective of attempting to ascertain what the future returns might be if you made an investment in the stock today. As I indicated in the written portion of this article, Johnson & Johnson really has generated one of the most impeccable records of long-term earnings growth and other fundamentals growth since going back to 1999, which is far back as I can go. So I'm going to take a real quick look at some of these. Met Let's start with adjusted operating earnings. You can see Johnson & Johnson has grown earnings very consistently, even during the recession of 2001 and the Great Recession of 2008. It looked like there was no recession for Johnson & Johnson in either case. When I put their dividends with the dividend payout ratio, you can also see a consistent record of dividend growth. The long-term operating earnings growth rate over this time frame was 10.2%. But I want you to notice looking at the bottom of the graph here, there was some really high growth, 32% from 98 to 99, 20% into 2000. But in more recent years, you'll see that growth rate has slowed down. So let's chop some time off of this graph and let's look at it since 2006. Now we see earnings growth rate of 6.6%. And again, we go through the Great Recession, very consistent operating earnings growth and very consistent dividend growth. Chop it down again. We'll chop it down to 2011. We see we stay in about a 6.8% growth rate. So all in all, this company is a very consistent producer, but it's now a $341 billion plus market cap. It's AAA rated, offers a current dividend yield of 2.9% and a blended PE, which I'll get into when I bring price of 16.6. It only has 32% debt to capital. So this is a blue chip, clearly. Now let's look at some other earnings metrics. One of the things that happened in 2017 was they took a huge special tax charge thanks to tax reform, and therefore their gap earnings dropped precipitously from $5.93 to $0.47. Cents. However, the market has looked past that, as I'll show you here in a moment. When I look at cash flow, since this is a dividend champion and aristocrat. Let's look at dividends for a moment for how well dividends are covered based on operating cash flow. You can see they generate very consistent operating cash flow growth as well. The dividends is extremely well covered. And even if you look at free cash flow, which is what's left over after the, what it cost them to run the business, you see that their free cash flow more than amply covers their dividend. Their free cash flow payout ratio is averaging about 40 to 50 percent, depending on when you're measuring it. So this is a really an excellent long term investment. We can look at other metrics such as EBITDA or earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation and amortization. And once again, we see a great deal of consistency and consistent growth. Now let's bring monthly closing prices into the equation and talk a little bit about how Johnson & Johnson's been valued by the market. On a price to EBITDA, the EBITDA growth rate's been 7.8 and the average multiple of EBITDA has been about 12.8. So this orange line is an EBITDA multiple of 12.8 and you can see some periods where the price, which is the black line, these are monthly closing prices, was above that. Coming into the Great Recession, we saw a period of very low valuation and then we saw some high valuation coming into the end of 2017 and now we see a reconciliation back to a normal price to EBITDA. If I go back to adjusted operating earnings, which is really the valuation metric that I like to look at most, we can see a couple of very interesting things here. One is we see the irrational exuberant period back in 1999 where PE ratios were up in the 38, 39 range. This kind of led to a really a kind of a poor performance of Johnson & Johnson over this time frame. If I go from this peak where the PE was 32 in March of 2002 into the Great Recession, it only generated an annualized rate of return to 2.8%. I bring that out because this illustrates the importance evaluation. In contrast, if I go to the bottom here when valuation was lowest coming in, into the Great Recession in February of 2009 and held it to current price, we get a rate of return of 12.7 percent. Now this is going to be important in this video because what I'm going to really talk about here in a moment is you know valuing Johnson & Johnson today relative to what I would expect to be able to earn on it going forward. But I did want you to see how valuation impacts operating results. Now if you look at other metrics like operating cash flow, or let's look at diluted earnings first. You know, I mentioned that the market looked past the big drop in diluted earnings. You can see that Johnson & Johnson stock price was rising even though gap earnings were down substantially because again, that was a one-time 
tax reform, you know, severe charge that really didn't affect their cash flows and their operating business. So the market looked past that. And of course, I also want to point out it didn't impact their dividend. They actually raised their dividend from 315 in 2016. I'll shorten the time frame here to three dollars and 32 cents in 2017, even though they had this big drop in gap. And then they're expected to generate about three dollars and 56 cents in dividends going forward. Now, let's move on and look at some other very important attributes about Johnson & Johnson relative to what the future might hold. To me, this is really what this video and this particular article is about. What can I rationally expect to earn on Johnson & Johnson going forward? Now, I'm going to go to the forecasting calculators here, and I want to emphasize exactly that. These are calculators. What these allow me to do is make some reasonable assumptions, reasonable forecasts, and then run, as I said in the written part, run the numbers out to their logical conclusion. So let's start with the normal PE multiple. And we have a drop down window here. Let's examine what Johnson & Johnson's normal valuation has been or how the market has normally valued the stock historically. Now the long term normal multiple is very high at 18.7. And if I use that very high multiple, which was distorted by high valuation, if you recall the historical graphs, Johnson & Johnson would be an astounding performer, a really excellent double digit 15% out to 2020, even 11.5% out to 2021, assuming these estimates are correct. Now, Johnson & Johnson also has a very excellent scorecard, which tells me a couple of things. One, analysts tend to get this company right, probably because the company guides them correctly. You know, when you see a scorecard like this, when you look at Johnson & Johnson's record, their, their one year forward forecast, they've, they've literally hit 100% of the time in both one and two year forward. So that gives me some credibility that these estimates might, might be within a reasonable range of error. I have a 10% a error for the one year forecast and a 20% error on the two year forecast. So bottom line is I feel reasonably comfortable here, but this is a very high valuation. So let's go back and let's look at and examine what historical multiples have been. Now we can see that there were times when Johnson & Johnson was trading at a 15 PE, 15 to 16 PE. More recently, as I showed you earlier in 2017, a PE's got high up into the 17 to almost 18 range. So let's pick a more rational or more conservative PE and let's go ahead and do 15.5 here. So if Johnson & Johnson were to grow earnings at 6.2%, which is the average of these growth rates here listed at the bottom of the graph, pretty widely followed. The analysts drop off down to seven by the time you get to 2021. But given that it would trade at this PE ratio, which by the way, which would be a contraction from the current 16.6, then we would have very modest rate of return for this year, this fiscal year, which ends in December of about two and a half percent. That would get a little better going outward because we do expect some, you know, about 6% growth in 2019. That would give us about a 6% total rate of return. Going out to 2020, it would be a 7% rate of return. And going out to 2021, which is expected by seven analysts to be a relatively weak year for whatever reason, that would drop that rate of return down to 6%. Now, this is using analyst estimates. I have another long-term analyst estimate growth rate, which is the three to five year growth rate. There are eight analysts that are forecasting a 7.7% growth rate. So let's look at that and check that out relative to the company's actual historical cost compound annual growth rate, which is this tab here. I've got a drop down window here and I can look at for the 20 year period, as I showed you, or 19 year period, Johnson & Johnson has grown earnings at about 10 and a half percent. But as it's gotten bigger, growth has been harder to come by. We can see a lot of years here, an eight year average of 5.9, a nine year average of 5.4. Then we have a nice little surge in growth again. The last couple of years, we're back to that seven, eight percent range. And that probably explains why analysts are forecasting a 7.5% growth rate going forward. Now, if I applied that 16.5 PE ratio that we talked about earlier, or you know, something a little, you know, a little premium to the normal 15 that I like, and even say let's give it a 16.5 PE ratio, if it was able to grow at these rates, it would be about a 9.5% total annualized rate of return. Um, however, I can also utilize different historical growth rates in this calculation. I can, if I use the 10 year average growth rate, that rate of return would drop to 6.7%. What I'm doing here is I'm running what if scenarios. What if it only grew by 6% or 5.8? What if it grew by 
nine and a half or ten percent again, then my rates of return would be higher. And as a you know trying to determine whether or not I'm going to make an investment in Johnson and Johnson or not, what I really am trying to do is come up with a number here that I consider to be reasonable. I'm pretty sanguine about a six or seven percent rate of return. The analysts are talking seven. I'm going to go ahead and use a six percent number here and go ahead and apply that growth rate onto my historical, using historical growth as a proxy instead of analyst estimates. And here I'm getting some decent numbers at 15 to 16 PE ratios. And considering this is a triple A rated company with a very strong balance sheet, I might feel comfortable making an investment recognizing that I'm going to potentially generate rates of return of six or seven percent going forward. Now I could also get creative and go into the custom calculator here and I could you know apply whatever growth rates or even whatever PEs. If I like that 17 PE ratio I'll go ahead and use the override here and draw the 17 PE ratio if I would consider that a reasonable valuation for Johnson & Johnson and then based on a 7.7 percent growth rate I would have expectations for double digit returns. That's certainly plausible. Now I can also combine the long-term three to five year trend line growth rate forecast with these normal estimates here by simply clicking this little button here. And all I'm doing is taking my calculator and creating different growth scenarios or different earnings scenarios and start, you know, looking around and seeing what types of returns. So I believe Johnson & Johnson is a solid, you know, seven to nine percent potential rate of return investment. What I'm extremely confident about is their dividend. If I go ahead and increase this to the long term graph, and go down and look at their dividend record, you can see their dividend growth has been about almost 11% going back to 1998. However, but just by looking at this column, I can see that dividends growth has been 7 or 8%. So if I cut that down to, let's say, a 12-year a graph here and look at these lower dividend yields, now I've got a 7% growth more recently. I'm probably more comfortable expecting that going forward. But as you can see, Johnson & Johnson has outperformed the S&P on total dividends. It's underperformed it on a capital appreciation return since December of 2008. And of course, we've had a great market and it's underperformed on a total return. So it's been really about the income going forward. I extend that out to a 15-year graph and I get a little slightly different perspective. We've now tied the S&P 500, but we did produce more income and we get a slightly higher rate of return. So what I'm doing here is I'm looking at the impact of valuation coupled with earnings growth. Bottom line is I think Johnson & Johnson is a, a good solid, you know, six to eight percent long term investment from here for from a triple A rated company. It would have less risk than the general market, in my opinion. But again, I don't expect it to be a 10 bagger. The company's a three hundred and forty billion dollar company at this point. Nevertheless, I would like to end and summarize this presentation by talking about a couple of things here. I, the, the fast graph generates a 15 what would be considered normal or reasonable fair valuation. That's an earnings yield of about six point. 6%. So this is a valuation reference. That orange line is a 15 PE no matter where I touched it. So just by looking at this graph, I can see very high PEs here, obviously above the orange line. I had PEs up in the 30s. I had PEs up in the 17, 18 range. And then coming into the recession, which is you know the gray shaded area, I had a period of time where I had 10 and 12 PE ratios. So as I'm looking at this, what's the opportunity? Then we had this period of high valuation. We had high valuation in 2014. It reverted to the mean for a very short period of time and got down to just about a 15 PE by September of 2015. Then we had a nice run for the next couple of years. But since the beginning of 2017 here, or of 2018, excuse me, it's dropped about 10%, 9.8%, and it's moving back to a reversion to the mean. So the question is, do I wait or do I go ahead and buy the stock? If I look at the last 15 years here and then bring in the normal P.E. ratio, I see a normal P.E. ratio of 15.7, which is obviously a little better than the 15 P.E. Bottom line is the stock is not excessively undervalued at this point, but it's no longer extremely overvalued as I felt it was in most of 2017. So for a AAA rated blue chip, it's probably looks, starting to look attractive again. But again, I leave it up to you. Do you wait for a little better valuation? The last time I looked um, at Johnson & Johnson this morning, 
the stock was down a little bit, but that's that's the market. It's down a little bit from here. Do you want to wait till you know what what would be a target price? You know, if it got down to 121 or so, that might be a lot more attractive, but that's pretty close at, at 126. Nevertheless, I think Johnson & Johnson is a blue chip stock with a decent dividend yield currently. And there's worse stocks out there to buy based on valuation than Johnson & Johnson. I hope you enjoyed the video. This has been Chuck Carnivale saying thanks for watching.